Okay. Um, we spend apparently billions of dollars each year trying to improve the integrity of elections around the world. Um, and when Pippa first came up with her project, uh, or at least when she first uh, bent my ear with it, uh, what I said to her right off the top of the cuff was, yes, Pippa, but does integrity truly matter? Does it make any difference to anything important uh, in life? And she said, well, that's for us to find out. <laughs> but she then cancelled the one chapter that was going to be <laughs> focusing on this. Right. Um, so I thought that when I came here as a visitor, I should put my money where my mouth was and try to fill in with a paper that would, that might have been that chapter. So the um, intuition is given in the second paragraph here. The U.S. has absolutely terrible electoral integrity, and yet American congressmen are legendary for their ability to keep both ears to the ground. Uh, the only other animal in the, uh, only member of the animal kingdom that can do that is the jackass. Um, keeping both ears to the ground and responding to their constituents in the most insanely uh, attentive fashion. By contrast, uh, Sweden is supposed to have one of the highest electoral integrities on Earth, but the only work we have on responsiveness and representation in Sweden tells us that Sweden has representation from above. Parties tell voters what to think, and voters dutifully think what they're told, um, which I never actually believed, but that's what the conventional wisdom in Sweden currently states. Um, so if this is the case, then what's electoral integrity good for? Of course, um, responsiveness by parties to voter concerns may not be a recipe for good governance, but I leave that aside. Um, at least we, suppose we gen justify democracy on the basis that elections keep governments and by, in, by influence parties are uh, closely attentive to voter concerns, and if that's the case, we should see some sign of this in the data. So I approach the topic in a way that I don't believe it's been approached before uh, at the level of political parties. If elections are functioning to enhance representative processes, then parties should be attempting to maintain a close fit between the policies they espouse, even if not the policies that they enact, and the policies that their voters prefer. So they should respond to signals from voters, signals uh, given by voters reducing their support or increasing their support. If, if, if voters reduce their support for their party, their party, the party they would normally vote for, then the party should get concerned and should try to do whatever it takes to ingratiate themselves with the party, with the voters, and try to make the voters feel that they're being responsive so that the voters will in, in increase their support. And voters should notice that parties have moved and have taken account of their concerns and should reward them with increased support if indeed they do this. On the other hand, if parties see that the voters are really close and, 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 and tight with them, then they can go off and do their own thing without the need to take account of voter concerns until such time as the voters signal their dissatisfaction. So, uh -uh, that didn't do it. How do I go about this? Um, my problem is that in order to study these processes, I need time series data. And time series data cross-nationally is really um, not available very widely. I need it cross-nationally because electoral integrity is measured at the national level. If I want to find variance in electoral integrity, then I have to have multiple countries. What we do have are repeat cross-sections of all sorts of kinds. 
Uh, I mostly focus in, these paper, in this paper on repeat cross-sections taken in Europe of the members of the European um, Union at the time of European Parliament elections, which is not because I'm interested in European Parliament elections, but that they provide a convenient point in time at which to interview members of all the different countries. Um, and another source is the CSES, which I managed after four weeks of beating my head against the wall to pull together just in time. There's a postscript to this uh, presentation which uses CSES data. But as I say, these data sets are cross-sectional and I need time series. So what I do is I raise the level of analysis to the birth year cohort level. We're used to getting time series by raising the level of analysis to the country level. People do that all the time. Sometimes to the party level. The birth year cohort level is the lowest level of analysis that is conceptually identical across time. And I am very keen on advertising the use of data at that level for um, political science research. Um, so at that level, we need to justify the notion that um, variants at that level will echo the variance we would see at the individual level. Some people might think that by aggregation we would wash out precisely the variance that we're interested in. But I think that actually the birth year level is precisely the level at which um, we will see the variance that we're interested in. Many of our theories are actually couched at that level. We think that younger voters are those that are attracted to new parties. We think that changes in election rules mainly affect young voters. All sorts of things are affected by the transition to adulthood uh, and the educational experiences that occur at that time. These will be different for succeeding cohorts of voters precisely because the experiences are going to be different. And when we try to find reasons for evolutions in party support and, and voter turnout, we quite normally turn to the um, to explanations that focus on um, cohorts of voters that enter the electorate at different times. Um, for all those reasons, we should see the kind of echo uh, that I'm hoping for. Uh, we also get a relatively large N when we do this. The number of birth year cohorts that we will distinguish if we distinguish people born in a particular year who are voting for a particular party will come well within an order of magnitude of the number of individuals. I mean, think about it. Time series data extending over 20 years will give us something like 120 birth year cohorts. Um, six parties will give us um, you know, seven, 720 birth year units. Four, four time points gives us 500 cases. You know, this, no, there's 5,000 cases. This is a lot of data. Um, and it would be surprising if it didn't echo the variance that we see at the individual level. Um, and moreover, there is one place where I can actually validate this, which is with American um, election study data, ANES data, which happens to have embedded within it three separate panels where the same individuals were interviewed on three successive occasions. Um, and when we compare the lagged values that we expect from certain variables from the birth year level with the actual values we see at that previous time point at the individual level, what we find is a staggering correspondence, an absolutely staggering. Look at the bottom row. The spikes are um, estimates of position taken from the lag birth year. The lines are the actual values seen at the individual level. 
So the spikes don't just fall within the confidence interval, they match the confidence interval that we see at the individual level, except in just that case where the spike is shorter. Obviously, we had more n at the point at which we derived the spike the next year, which was a presidential election. The spike data, individual level data, is a midterm election data. Many fewer people were voting. So this, it's not that the spike is shorter. It's that the, it's that the gap it's trying to fall within is larger. The match is not quite so good for the upper set of points, which are uh, based on the question about uh, where Democrats are located um, on uh, le in, it's not left-right location, it's liberal conservative location. Sorry about that. Um, and I have a theory that would tell us why the spikes actually are more accurate than the individual level data, but I won't waste your time with it now. Turning to the um, econometrics of the situation, um, Valesian is the one who first set out the, repre the, the representational theory that sees actually policy making, in his case, moving to um, match uh, vote public preferences and public preferences reacting in a negative, in terms of negative feedback to the changes in policy. Um, in this research, I take the signals of dissatisfaction to be mani manifested in reduced levels of party support and reactions to those signals to be um, manifested in the closeness that parties manage to place, them, with which parties manage to place themselves to, to their voters. So reduced support should cause parties to take steps to improve the fit. Increased support uh, should uh, allow parties to ignore uh, voter positions. So the steps that parties take do not just include moving their positions, they also include persuading voters uh, to change their positions. But we should see parties moving if what is happening is representation as normally conceived. So let's move on to um, the, the actual uh, estimation process. Economists have a huge problem that is built in to their fundamental theories, which is that these are conceived of at the um, long term, in a long term perspective. There's this famous joke about two economists walking down the street, and one of them sees a $20 bill in the street and says, my goodness, look, there's a $20 bill. And the first one says, no, no, my boy, it couldn't possibly be. Somebody would have picked it up long ago. Um, so. <laughs> If you're thinking in the long term, of course there's no $20 bill in the street. But in the immediate instance, there might be. And of course, from time to time, there will be one that hasn't been picked up yet. So error correction for economists is a way for them to focus on the long term by correcting away the ephemeral, as they see it, um, variations that occur on the short-term basis which are not interesting to them from a theoretical perspective. Now, we as citizens and consumers might really wish that economists would focus more on deviations from uh, long-term expectations because then they might successfully predict the kind of crash that we had uh, in 2009. You know, focusing on the long-term, things like that don't happen. And, most of the econ economists I know still believe that such things don't happen. They just happen to happen then, but of course they'll never happen again um, because economic theory doesn't predict them. Uh, so as I say, we could wish that economists would focus on the short term, but for us, error correction models are absolutely perfect. They really do the job 
uh, when we're trying to deal with representation. The general template is the top line. Error correction is simply a negative coefficient from the previous time point. The thing that we used to refer to when I was learning my methods as uh, regression to the mean. You know, the children of tall people tend to be less tall. The children of short people tend to be less short. Um, that's error correction at work. Um, in the case of uh, representation, what Valesian is telling us is that policymakers who are trying to keep close to what people want will, if they're producing too much policy in one year, uh, correct that towards what people want uh, and, and vice versa. That same model also works the other way around for responsiveness. So the responsiveness model expects the um, stimuli, proximity, to be positively related to support. If proximity goes up, support should go up. Okay? People feel themselves to be closer to their party, so they support it more. <coughs> the representation model the stimuli should be negatively related to uh, the dependent variable. As support goes down, parties should try to improve the proximity. As support goes up, they should feel able to ignore proximity. So we expect the signs to, on the responsiveness model to be different. We also expect uh, the, the representation model to involve a lag because it takes time for parties to change their positions. The responsiveness model can be immediate. People can notice that the party is no longer where they want it to be and reduce their support instantly. Parties cannot change their positions instantly. They have, and in particular, they cannot communicate changes in their positions instantly. So the representation model both involves a different sign and a different lag. So, Responsiveness and representation are distinguished by the signs of the effect and the extent of the lags. First set of data, as I said, are taken from European Parliament election studies. The questions that I focus on, however, are not about European Parliament elections. They are about the party's left-right position at the time of European Parliament elections. They are about people's support for those parties at the time of European Parliament election, but the parties that are mentioned are not specifically the parties uh, that are, are, uh, are contesting those elections, and indeed the parties that I focus on are the parties that people supported at the most recent previous uh, national election. So. These data have the disadvantage of being collected at regular five-year intervals, whereas, in fact, the representational process should be occurring at the rate of whatever cycle exists in the individual countries, which is generally a four-year cycle, sometimes a five-year cycle in Britain and Malta and France, sometimes a three-year cycle uh, in Sweden and, and some other countries. So there's a mismatch here that uh, should inject, um, can't do, should inject um, error into, into the findings. So the hypotheses follow pretty closely from what I've just said, and I won't go through them individually. Um, H4 is the interesting one. The effects should be stronger. Perhaps they should only be found where electoral integrity is high. So first requirement is that voters should know where those parties stand and notice changes in stance. Okay, so what we see is party support adjusting positively to changes in proximity one electoral cycle later. And there's, yeah, T minus one. With very high variance explained. So parties, supporters reward their parties by increasing their support when closeness proximity improves. The second requirement, as I've explained, is that parties should respond to changes in, in support. And what we see is that proximity adjusts to changes in support. 
negatively, two electoral cycles later, again with very high variance explained, actually with more variance explained. So the effect of failing, falling support is to make parties correct the mismatch, either by moving towards their voters or by persuading their voters to move towards them. Well, who changes? The answer, which I won't go into in detail, is that both parties and voters change. Parties move positively towards their voters by approximately the same amount that voters move negatively towards their parties. It's a very close balance. Parties do persuade their voters to change their positions, or maybe voters misperceive the positions of parties, which is also which can't be distinguished. But parties also shift their positions. So we see effects of representation and persuasion that are virtually of the same magnitude. OK, how about electoral integrity? I have, the only way I can do this is by selecting groups of countries that show high um, values for representation or for responsiveness uh, and contrast them with countries that show low values. And um, when I do this for U Western Europe, I find no meaningful differences. All countries effectively show good representation and good responsiveness. Eastern Europe is a different um, story, but unfortunately for East European post-communist countries, I only have three time points, so I can only check the responsiveness model. Arguably, representation without responsiveness makes no sense, so this, is a good, uh, this should be a good fundamental check. And what we see is when we focus on the post-dominance, we see absolutely nothing. No, uh, no um, significant effects. Except for three countries where we do see rudimentary e effects on the cusp of, uh, of uh, significance uh, in the right direction. Poland, Slovakia, and Slovenia. And interestingly, these countries um, have in common that they score highest in terms of honest elections of all those communist countries. So there is just a whiff of something worth studying. Um, and I am therefore encouraged, I was therefore encouraged to start banging my head against the brick wall of CSES data um, and came up last night with a usable data set that staggeringly shows the same thing as I just showed you, couched in slightly different terms. People like parties more when the parties are close to them. When their liking declines, parties respond by improving the closeness. When the closeness improves, parties respond, people respond by increasing the, the amount that they like those parties. Very nice. Um, there is a lot of variation across countries. And um, that variation is explained by different things for responsiveness than for representation. Honest elections works for responsiveness, just as it did with the East Europeans. And one of the countries is the same. Poland is in both data sets. Mm -hmm. And Poland is a country that responds to honest elections in both data sets, which could be a coincidence, but at least it's promising. Um, for representation, what matters is free and fair. Now, I have no idea what is evoked in a voter's mind by the question, was the election free and fair, that is different from what is evoked in the voter's mind by the question, was this an honest election? But the two do not correlate. They correlate about point 0.1. People see something different in those two questions, and that something different relates to whether the country is one in which uh, responsiveness is evident, or whether it is one in which um, representation is evident, or both. So that's it, folks. Um, I'm sorry I ran over.